two, 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 and a mic. So I am joined by the two um, social wonders of German business that are Vlad and Fritz. Once again, thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, so we're basically continuing some of our discussions that we had begun uh, a few weeks ago. Um, yeah, just to let everybody know who is listening, how you're doing, gentlemen. Any uh, any updates on your your situation? Are you still sort of psychologically dealing with everything quite well? What's the what's the situation with you? Hi, this is Vlad and Sack. Thank you very much for the invitation today. Again, it's really a pleasure to be here, and I'm very excited about the next uh, couple of minutes that we're going to talk. I'm sure about very exciting topics and yeah i'm doing very good my family is also doing very good thank you for asking and uh, yeah happy to be here wonderful to have you uh fritz yeah also from my side thanks again for um, inviting us again i wasn't too sure after our last podcast whether you wanted <laughs> us again on, on a debate um i've been doing quite well enjoying the summer and i'm um, looking forward to the next minutes or hour and um, our topics yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and just to give people a bit of um, a bit of an idea on, you know, okay, we're all in Berlin, but we haven't actually seen each other for a number of months. Um, uh, in, in Berlin, the situation has been such that it, for a few months, I think between uh, February and May, the the number the cases of um, Corona basically were, were either continuously going up at a stable rate. Um, or they remain stagnant for quite a period. But then um, in the last two weeks, numbers began to drop. Now, whether that is, that is connected to some of the long weekends that we've had and people not seeing one another or, or not, I don't know. Um, but looking at some of the figures over the last couple of days, it seems that in Berlin, things are going up again. Is that how you, how you guys uh, sort of see things? You can go for um, it. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I, I can't really tell since I spent the last couple of days uh, in the countryside in northern Hesse. But uh, as far as I noticed today when I came back to Berlin that, yeah, coffee shops and, and, and bars has, uh, had opened up again and people were on the streets sitting in the park. So I think the situation is more relaxed than a couple of weeks ago. And um, yeah, that's why I'm also quite positive and um, euphoric and looking forward to the summer, which will hopefully start uh, as of this week. Yeah. Okay. Fingers crossed. I mean, I, I'm, I'm getting sort of mixed messaging with regards to that, but I mean, I, I hope you're right there, Fritz. Um, and uh, you know, and these any sort of sudden rise in cases is just a, an anomaly, um, and, and it will continue the uh, the negative trend soon. Um, Vlad, what about you? How do you see things? A uh, very similar. I also I am I'm got the impression this week that uh, people are coming back to normality. So um, as you know, restaurants and so on they start uh, opening in the outdoor area. I think one or two weeks ago, and and yeah, it's not the same because you have to show a a, a negative test. So it's a uh, let's say it's a bit complicated because you have to be tested and then wait for the results and then you can um, join a yeah a terrace or a beer garden. But yeah, I'm very positive, and and yeah, we um, we shouldn't forget that uh, we are vaccinating now very very fast. I guess we achieved uh, this week uh, 40 millions or something like this of people that they uh, has uh, have at least one uh, one jab of the vaccine. So yeah, very positive. Okay, well that's basically 50 percent who have at least got one jab. Um, so I guess that as you say that that's pretty good, uh, considering where we were two two or three months ago basically. Yeah, I guess we were very concerned about the, the vaccination uh, here in Germany. As uh, you know, at the very beginning, there was, that wasn't that clear if, uh, yeah, there was a lot of uh, problems, the, the European coordination, but uh, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and, and just because you have um, your finger on the pulse, as it were, of other areas as well, Vlad, um, I mean, you, know, you, you mentioned there that we were a little bit worried about the, the progress of vaccinations in Germany or in Europe in general. But um, I mean, it's still a luxurious position to be in, isn't it, in comparison to other areas uh, which you're familiar with, like uh, South America? Um, you know, what, what is the, the role out there? Because from what I've heard, um, it's... Yeah, it, it, it's it's not getting that much better in, in some areas. Yeah, you are totally right. So it's also a um, let's say more complex situation because if something like lockdowns and so on, the way you are um, we are experiencing it here is just just not possible over there. You know, like the state uh, hasn't enough money to uh, to ask the people to close their business and then receive some kind of help from the state. So people have ha, uh, have to survive and they um, have to keep uh, selling what they are selling or um, doing the business they have been doing. And yeah, that's uh, not good for Corona. And, and that's why we have a lot of cases, a lot of uh, people that, uh, that are uh, dying. I guess now the situation is uh, getting better. We are also vaccinating. So um, yeah, for the people that doesn't um, know, I'm from Colombia. And uh, the situation now there is that we are vaccinating, but I think yeah, like a hundred, hundred fifty thousand um, jabs per day. So it's a let's say nothing compared to the one million that we are now having here. Mm, yeah. yeah, unfortunately, there are a lot of areas which don't benefit from um, you know, the kind of financial abilities that um, the U.S. and European countries benefit from. Um, and, and I think it's fair to to cast a mind to those who are, you know, who yeah. unfortunately don't see a way out as quickly as we do. Yeah, it's also an um, interesting thing. There's a lot of people, well, not not really a lot, but they, an important um, amount of people that are flying to the to the U.S. just for doing um, yeah vaccination tourism. Let's say they go just for a weekend and they 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 don't need anything. They just say. Uh, even at, the, at Walmart or something like this, they are getting uh, vaccinated and then they fly back to Colombia. So that's what the whole, let's say, upper middle and high class of Latin America is doing right now. Wow. I mean, don't they have to you know, provide some kind of uh, medical identification? Because, I mean, you know, the insurance pays for this, right? Anything, anything. And you can choose if you want to get a Johnson or a, or a Moderna or BioNTech. So, um, yeah. I mean, it's the best way to uh, to restart your economy. One shot, you are paying eight euros at state, and the people that are going there for one weekend, they are spending on average three thousand dollar. So it's uh, at the end, it's uh, the best thing they can do. Well, I suppose uh, when you look at it from that perspective, um, crazy. Okay, Fritz, any thoughts on that? I just listened to uh, to the Deutschlandfunk today on my car ride, and um, there was a documentation about vaccination in Eastern Europe. And apparently in Serbia, they started opening up for basically everybody else outside Serbia to come to Serbia and get the shot there. And the reason for um, for that is that they had um, so many doses left, is that it's quite a lot of skepticism inside Serbia towards the vaccination jab. And therefore, yeah, quite a lot of people from all over Europe traveled to Serbia in order to get their jab. So, yeah, different, different setup, but um, also I found that quite interesting. Yeah, I've heard similar things from um, my, my uncle told me about um, his relative in, in Yerevan, in Armenia, um, and, you know, that, um, you know, she'd contacted the doctor saying, you know, when are you going to invite me for my jab? And the doctor responded saying, well, look, I, you know, I need to have a certain number of people that I can open the medicine for. And at the moment, nobody wants it. Um, and yeah, so yeah, what you're saying is, you know, I, I believe, um, and at the same time, I find it difficult to believe because, um, I mean, where does this, um, yeah, this, I don't know, this level of, um, you know, doubt come from, I mean, you know, because it's, I mean, Croatia and, uh, Armenia are, or did you say Croatia or Serbia? Sorry. Uh, Serbia. Serbia. So Serbia and Armenia, I mean, these are hardly countries which are you know, in close sort of contact with one another. I don't really know why there is uh, such a huge amount of uh, demand of uh, uh, amount of doubt um, towards the the Japs, but um, I mean we also have those conspiracy theorists 
uh, in Western Europe or in Germany who don't want to get their vaccination, especially in Germany, they are called Impfverweigerer or Impfskeptiker. Um, yeah. And um, but I never heard a solid argument why they don't want the jab. Yeah. Well, I mean, there I are rumors. There are rumors about uh, uh, lower fertility and and all sorts of things, but those are just rumors. There's no scientific proof, and uh, it's quite the contrary. I mean, I mean, if you are suffering or if you get if you get infected with COVID-19, then you definitely have uh, more problems to deal with uh, than with the side effects of a jab. Mm. No. Um, but, sorry, Vlad. Did you want to say something? Um, yeah. So well. I I got the impression is um, the, the the biggest concern is about the the, um, the speed so how fast they they were ready with the with the vaccine you know like and normally it takes uh, years like 10 15 years to um to create a vaccine to test it with the with with some uh, cases and then to to bring it into the market and now it was like uh, within one year not even and that's why people are yeah, wondering. Okay, what are going to be? What's going to happen in, in two or two years? Because that's a thing that they, we don't know. But there is enough, um, let's say, evidence, scientific evidence that they, that shouldn't be really a, a problem, and it's also a different situation. So normally, when you are testing a vaccine, you don't have the millions of people that they, that couldn't be a, like a potential tester, and that's the case right now, and that's why it was that uh, fast. And yeah, and I think it's also a, a problem here because uh, the, the reason why, for example, in my case, I already got the uh, AstraZeneca was because people um, they they uh, weren't um, accepting it, and that's why the, the the government at some point said, okay, that's now a uh, everyone who who wants to to have one uh, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine then can do it. Yeah, because as you say, people were avoiding it on the basis of some of the um, the the, uh, the 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 brain. It's not not a brain tumor, but these these blood clots that they were having in the brain. Um, and yeah. I mean, yeah, lots of people have said that uh, the numbers involved are so small and so on. But you know, I mean, when I got my um, Pfizer Biontech jab, um, you know, it's still something that's sort of in the back of your mind. Um, you know, that anything could happen. You could be the one. You know, that's always what. Uh, it's just a thought, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, still. Okay, all right. Um, as you can imagine, gentlemen, I haven't invited you here for your medical uh, knowledge, um, uh, but then again, um, that wouldn't be too hard to believe, seeing as it surpasses my own anyway. Um, but you are two, um, you know, two specialists in the area of um, human resources management, planning and strategy. Um, and, you know, as the name of our podcast suggests, which is Startups and Whiskey, um, you guys have had some wonderful experiences and that's why the whiskey was an inherent part of what now I'm joking. OK, um, but, you know, with regards to, yeah, um, what you've done. So as we were talking a bit before, Vlad, you sort of you began um, talking about something which you know, I feel is an important introduction into what we want to talk about later on with regards to business and people strategy. Um, and namely, that is this idea of um, you know, developing a culture within an organization. Um, and, you know, where you are um, or some of the experiences that you've had, um, you know, how, how important is it to establish this quite early on? How important is it to, to establish the... Um a culture very let's say at the earliest phase of a startup of a company mm. um well i would love to start with a clarification and it's the um, let's say as a matter of fact culture is not a thing that you can really create so even if you don't care about your culture you will always have one you know compare maybe to um let's say to a country when when you go the first time to the I don't know to the US or maybe to Colombia, you are not going to get like a kind of onboarding session where someone on the airport is going to explain you the culture. It's a thing that it's uh, there and it's a thing that is always uh, evolving. So that's why we let's say that we are very interested in trying to shape a culture in a way that we think is good for the people, is uh, good for the performance of the company, but uh, at the end is something that the you don't have really a huge influence on that. So um, it starts um, even earlier when you are uh, recruiting people, when you are hiring people, 
really defining that the the way you hire people is should be after um, some cultural aspects and not only looking for um, good skills. So I'm not sure. Maybe I'm I'm taking the the, the question too big. So maybe Fritz has a better idea for the for the question to so answer in a let's say in a more short way. No, no, that's cool. I mean, I'd love obviously I want Fritz to come in as well, but um, yeah, absolutely. You know, there's the establishment, as it were, of, of a culture, um, as you say, you know, it, it can be or should be perhaps organic, but a lot comes from you know, the people that you introduce. Um, and that perhaps comes from, you know, if you're a startup, then the people who have created the startup will have a certain idea in mind. Um, but then they'll bring in specialists such as yourselves with whom to have that conversation. You know, uh, here we are now. This is my idea. How do we get from here to there? Um, you know, Fritz, I mean, can you perhaps enlighten us a bit on that that kind of process, which I mean, Vlad did a bit of as well. Um, I agree with Vlad uh, in, in terms of, I mean, you will always have a culture, no matter whether you want to implement a culture or not. I mean, as soon as you start a startup company, typically by maybe two or three founders, and then you have your first employees, and each employee has a different character. So um, even if you don't focus or if you don't um, create a culture where, which uh, should be lived by all your employees, your new your new employees, which were which are then onboarded, bring new elements to your culture. And I think the danger is that um, if you don't have a, a clear idea about your, the culture you want to have in, in your company, then there will be a culture developing by itself by sure. hiring more and more people. And this is why, similar to the finance aspect, um, I think the earlier you have clear processes in finance, the easier it gets to scale your startup. And I think this partly also applies to the people and culture section. And yeah, therefore, I definitely agree with you, Vladi. Yeah, I'm also, I'm, yeah, also fully agree with you. I, um, I would say... Well, just um, to let you know, now I'm really focused on culture management in the um, in my current um, uh, the position, and I would say that the most important thing is not only about defining a culture in terms of wording, because that's a thing that uh, you have many times in a lot of uh, startups, let's say unfortunately, that the the culture is reduced to a nice wording where you put in on your website, okay, we are um, I don't know a um, will of feedback and we ask why and and so on. The, the the biggest challenge or the, or the 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 core of the thing is how to operationalize this this culture so how to to evaluate it how to measure that culture and that's the thing what i'm doing here so when i'm talking to the ceo or to the founders of the company they come to me to an idea and they say i will i would love to have this culture and then my task or my challenge is to to show them, okay, but they, how can we measure them? Because if you say, okay, I love feedback, yeah, that's a thing that they good to know, but they, I can't start uh, anything with it. So it's also, let's say, beyond uh, this all kind of uh, nice words is uh, more about uh, how to create a culture that is really working and that you can measure at the every single time so that when I'm having a meeting with the with the management board of the company, I can tell them, okay, at that moment, we are culturally doing very good or doing very bad, or uh, there's uh, something that uh, we should do to improve, um, let's say, to improve our culture. Yeah, I think the point you're making there is also how to execute uh, a culture. I mean, in theory, Absolutely. it's definitely easier to think about, okay, we want this, we want that. And therefore, we implement, I don't know, a feedback session every couple of months and so on. But to really execute it, this is like the, the, the challenge uh, I see definitely, in, yes. at least in the company I'm working, I'm working for. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you guys know, I, you know, I love this word diversity. It's a bit of a buzzword for me. Um, and, you know, I, I think it, there is, you know, at the moment, the last couple of years, there's been a lot of talk about diversity. So it's not just me. I don't want to make out that I'm some kind of a trendsetter here. But um, with regards to culture of a company, um, you know, if you are directed towards creating a specific kind of culture within an organization, what is the danger of hiring too many people who are much of a muchness, we tend to say, as in, as in with similar character? And, you know, is it not the case that you also need diversity of characters within an organization uh, to be able to give uh, perhaps a more creative and nuanced approach to different issues? Um, yes and no. I mean, 
that, that's a topic I sometimes uh, have an argument uh, uh, within our company because I don't believe, I mean, I don't think it's good to, to focus on diversity for the sake of diversity. I mean, yesterday yeah. in the news, they said they want, uh, they want to have a higher percentage um, of the supervi supervisory board of the big corporate companies in Germany. They want more female um, members of the board. But I, on, I honestly believe, I mean, if I have a free position, a vacant position, I want the person who is the best in that position, whether that person is male or female black or white or yellow or red, I really don't care. Um, and therefore, I would rather have mm. a less diverse um, company in terms of employees, but therefore um, a better running business. Because in the end, it's about <coughs> business. And therefore, if I don't have a good business plan and business doesn't work, then I can have the greatest diversity in my company, but the company will go bankrupt. I'm totally with you. You know, what we are doing here is strategic workforce planning. We are not doing politics. So it's my my main task is to bring the right people to the company on the right time and for the right uh, price, let's say. So if I can find a, a, a woman or a man or a, yeah, as a Fritz said, that's not really important. But for sure, that's a, not as so simple as, a, as maybe it sounds. So for me, it's also important that we can create a space where people in this regard of uh, where they are coming from or what they are they have done before and so on that they can join the company and feel also good about it and that they don't feel discriminated but that would be a different thing my main point is just say uh, please don't do a, a politics while hiring or recruiting yeah i mean yeah. knowing you guys Agreed. Knowing both of you, I, I know how uh, supportive you are in, in your own sort of personal approaches with regards to you know diversity. How respectful you are of every you know culture that you've appro you've approached and uh, encountered. Um, I mean, even though my my initial uh, question was re with regards to diversity of personality as opposed to ah. gender or, or racial. But I mean, you can answer that again in, in a moment with regards to the diversity of character and personality. But I mean, this point is quite is important, in my opinion, because the supervisory boards don't run the company's day to day. That is the board of directors. The supervisory board is the group of individuals that sits behind the board of directors. They don't have to get involved in the nitty gritty. They can analyze things over a period of time. Um, and therefore, you know, to introduce greater diversity into the supervisory boards shouldn't necessarily damage the, the running of a company, should they? I mean, and can also somebody perhaps, I mean, because I don't really know too much about the structural setup of the supervisory boards and so on, and what size companies are required uh, to have uh, such a supervisory board. Could, could one of you explain that a bit more? Because I don't think these exist in the UK. Lavi, you can take that. <laughs> 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 okay, I was expecting that. No, but um, it's a it's a very good point. I would start with something different, and and it's um, not to avoid your question, but uh, I guess it could be a good clarification. You have two options. You can look for a cultural fit, and that's maybe the problem that they, you were uh, talking about, or you can look for a so-called cultural ad. So it's not about uh, looking people that really match with your culture. It's looking people that bring an added value to your culture. And for sure, you can only put this added value if you are in so you are somehow different. But I know there's always the, the 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 biggest question. Okay, do we want someone here like it's exactly thinking the way we want, or are we more let's say working on a culture where we love to break things, where we want to do something a uh, very different that people can join the company and say, hey, I, your culture is really good, but it would be better if we change it. And and I guess that's a that's the point that you were uh, mentioning before. If you are looking for a cultural fit or for a cultural ad. I mean, also when it comes to practice, the challenge is, I mean, most of the times for difficult positions, it's its very hard to find someone at all. So I usually don't have the luxury of uh, hire, uh, hiring the uh, yeah, a diverse character for a certain position. I'm uh, rather grateful if I find someone who has somehow 
expertise in that area and who's willing to join our company. This is what makes it so difficult for me, at least. But um, in general, I perfectly agree that um, you need diversity in terms of characters, because when basically all the people are always agreeing on everything, such as Vladi and I did so far in this podcast, then you won't be challenged in your ideas. And this is why it's so yeah, extremely important to have diverse characters in your, in your company. But you know what? I, what's diversity for you? That's also a, a huge question because a, a huge question because we can talk about diversity because we are all let's say the, the concept of diversity in Berlin is also very curious. It's about okay, I'm black, you are white, and, and at the end we are the same. We are all if you see all the people working in startups, they are very very similar to um. In, in, we are all between in our uh, 30s, let's say, we all uh, went to university, we all got a, a, a degree, we are uh, coming from, yeah, very similar environment. So at the end, it's, it's, a, it's, it's just a definition, I think, if we are looking for diversity in terms of uh, what exactly. Yeah, th this is a good point, and it's, it's fair if we can perhaps concentrate on that as well. Um, I mean, within within the trio that we are here, I think there is quite a certain amount of diversity. At the same time, we are very similar, as you suggested. So we we all are uh, you're moderately well educated, I would imagine. We all have a certain understanding of. Uh, social responsibility, a certain understanding of respect, of democracy, uh, and these kinds of ideals, even though we may disagree perhaps in some of these issues, but we have an understanding of you know, of how perhaps general society would view or would perhaps uh, you know, define these terms. Um, for me, diversity uh, essentially would suggest that there is not an There isn't an, uh, um, how would I say it was the best way? Um, there isn't a very clear individual characteristic which would define the vast majority of the people within a group so you know if you would be able to look at a group and not be able to straight away identify one particular facet um, then i would say that group has uh, diversity but if you look at a certain group and say okay well they're all uh, by munich fans yeah or they're all um they're all brits you know then I think there is a certain lack of diversity. You know, in situations where you cannot make that observation, then I think that you're on the right track. I mean, that's not perhaps a definition, but at least that is a very simple way to identify whether or not um, a certain group of people have a certain amount of diversity. Yeah. Yes, and I mean, even though maybe the majority of employees have a university background, I mean, It doesn't uh, always mean that they are similar since, I mean, uh, Vladi, I think you remember those times when it was, uh, yeah, there was for, for certain positions, um, there were people wanted with uh, yeah, a degree from an elite or so-called elite university. And I think you can even create some diversity if you have, if you hire people who went to a normal uh, university and don't have a background in one of the top, I don't know, 10 elite universities. Um, of, of the world and um, sometimes even hire people without any uh, university background I mean uh, it's, it's I think for me it's really hard to define diversity yeah. it has so many facets and aspects that I, I, I can't put it into one sentence I know but but let's be very honest I guess we are um, trying to understand diversity on a very high level so that they, we can say that we are a uh, diverse because Let's say, yeah, let's be very open. So imagine you are, I don't know, 45 or you are 50 and you try to apply to a startup. Uh, I'm not sure that you are going to have a, a very great uh, candidate experience and the possibility that you get rejected is very high. So that's when when then I if if I'm just a differentiate uh, making a, a difference because, um, I don't know, we have people coming from Stanford, and we also have people coming from a uh, Fachhochschule here in Berlin. That's for me just uh, like, okay, this is the, the uh, a very smallest detail. So it's uh, that's uh, that wouldn't be for me a, a diversity. But uh, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Okay. No, 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 I've got your point. I mean, so what's diversity for you? <sighs> 
we are next question. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the thing is that, uh, that um, for me, it's nothing that we can really have right now in 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 the the companies that uh, we are working for uh, now i know there is a trend i'm watching some companies in the in the us they are very modern it's uh, one of the companies that, that the name is uh, torre t o w r e if you want to um, to take a look at it um, after the podcast and they are doing for example all the hiring all the recruitment process is totally blind So you don't know the name of the people, you don't know um, how old they are, you don't know anything. You are only looking into facts. And then you are doing kind of a match that uh, it's a very uh, math based. And at the end, you have like a 80% um, match or 90%. And then you would say, okay, I'm going to, to hire that person. And then during the first day, you see that um, this, this person for the first time. That would be for me, okay, you are doing something for diversity. Why? Because you don't care about diversity. And that's the point. I don't know if, 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 you, if you know exactly yeah. what I mean, but it's when, I, when, when you stop talking about diversity, then you start being diverse. I get your point, but what about the culture? How can you uh, see whether that person fits to your culture? I mean, then you have a diverse company or a company with a certain amount of diversity, but um, you, I think your, your culture might be suffering because how, how, can you, how can you decide whether that candidate fits your culture if you haven't seen him, if you haven't spoken to him in that sense, if you don't know his name or background? This is at least how it sounded to me. Um, I understand that, but that shouldn't be a problem because... Um, If you do some tests or even if you have some interviews, so to, to explain a bit more, imagine you are the, 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 the recruiter who, are, who is responsible to, to make the decision, but I'm the guy who is interviewing the, um, the candidate. So at the end, you are only you are going to read the notes, what I wrote about the candidate without seeing him or her. But so, then it's very biased. Because then it's basically just your subjective impression of that. Person. Yeah, but uh, uh, when is, is recruitment not biased? Yeah, but uh, I mean, it, it, uh, if I if I'm sorry, Zach, um, if I may quickly respond to that, I mean, it's definitely less biased if I see your notes plus the CV um, of that candidate, so I can make my own uh, make up my own mind about him. Yeah, and at, uh, the, the, the last thing, you were talking at the very beginning about how to execute a, a culture. So you can mm -hmm. only execute a culture if you can uh, make it a measurable, that like really can, can measure your culture. And for sure, that thinks that they, it's not about impressions. Impression is important, but shouldn't be something that important. If you really have a way where you can put your culture into data, then for sure you can also um, see if a candidate is a fit or not for the culture without uh, having a walk and talk or having four hours of a one-on-one -on -one, um, chats. Sorry, Vladi, but I disagree. And um, the reason for that is that um, I learned to listen to my gut feeling. This is nothing which you can measure via data, but it usually proves me into, uh, directs me into the, into the right, uh, yeah, right direction. And this is something which you can only learn by experience or, or you might even be a wunderkind and have it uh, or a prodigy and have it from, uh, from early childhood onwards. But um, that's at least uh, a feeling I developed over the years. And um, I mean, eight years ago, I wouldn't have uh, the same view on a candidate as I have it today. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite quotes, we believe in God, all the rest must bring data. <laughs> Okay. All right. Just, just if I can come in with a couple of these points. So, with regards to this uh, Torre um, company, yeah, I still think even if you have no data or no identifiable data for an individual, you still have certain statistics which would lean a certain way. If you are looking, generally speaking, for mathematicians or engineers for a certain kind of university, the chances are the vast majority of applicants with that kind of background are going to be a certain, are going to be male, yeah? Um, and the thing is, until certain organizations introduce an, a, a tangible opportunity for a certain number 
you know, of diverse candidates, in which case we're talking about women or we're talking about people from uh, perhaps disadvantaged neighborhoods, perhaps disadvantaged cultures um, within certain areas and in different countries, you know, those who may be considered disadvantaged vary. So it's not the same thing everywhere. Um, you know, until such opportunities are applied, you are not going to find, for example, greater number of women um, applying to engineering or mathematics courses, because people are going to tell them, do you know what, you know, companies don't hire you. Companies don't hire you. And, I, and I've heard from a, you know, a number of women who are involved in the sciences you know, and I always ask them, I make it a point to ask them, you know, my students especially, um, how many how many women were on your course? You know, and some of them, which was brilliant to hear, some of them said 25 percent at least were women. Mm -hmm. That's a fantastic mm -hmm. development. But other people said 10 percent. You know, there were some people who told me, uh, you know, I was the only woman on my course, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is, you know. Well, I, and I'll just give you a silly example. When I was a kid, I went to do, I went to do work experience at the, the Tower of London and they were, they were carrying out archaeological excavations. And I went and spoke to the person who was in charge of that particular excavation. And, and I said, oh, I love archaeology. Um, yeah, I want to be an archaeologist when I grow up. And I was 15 mm -hmm. at the time. Um, and he said to me, I can tell you now with experience, don't. There's no money in it. Nobody's going to employ mm -hmm. you. Yeah, you have very, very few number of people are going to employ you. That was what he said to me. Now, if I were a woman and if I were talking to a career advisor and I said, you know, what, I want to do I'm thinking about doing mathematics. I think I'm quite good at maths. And that person said to me, you know what, you know, companies, they don't hire female mathematicians. You know, what that do to me? No, what? Mm. But as in, I'm not obviously this isn't your responsibility. I'm not saying you guys shy away from that kind of thing. But, you know, generally speaking, you know, until we break this cycle, you know, we are essentially forcing people to say, you know, if you want to have a future, go into this. Yeah. You know, as in, I think now is the time we have to break that cycle, really. Yeah, I see at least two things uh, in there. The first one, I would say nowadays, if you are a mathematician, if you are an a engineer and you are a woman, it's like, yeah, you are going to get the uh, tons of offers. I'm sure Fritz is also the same opinion because now companies are really like uh, looking active for uh, getting more uh, women on so-called uh, mint positions. And the second thing, um, I'm not sure if I see it or if I perceive it as a problem that uh, we don't have enough uh, women doing engineers. I I'm not sure if, if we are going in the in the right direction trying to change that the um, let's say trend. You know, in my case, I was the the, the last time I was uh, talking about um, fem feminism, I was uh, talking to a friend who is very into it. I started the conversation with I'm happy that I am man because if I would be a woman, I would be really criticized the whole time because everything I have done in my life would be typical for a woman. You know, I studied social science, then my master also did social science. I'm doing now a uh, human resources. So everything I have uh, done in my life is uh, I was in the university. I was um, maybe we were 80 in the in the whole year and we were just like five to 10 men. And now uh, working human resources, I also have like a 80 percent female uh, colleagues. So that that's why I'm not sure that um, that we have to start now uh, a movement that we need more men in 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 a uh, human resources or if we need more men uh, studying uh, sociology or history or political science or all those things that they, that I did before. May I ask you a question, Vladi? Why did you study social science and why did you end up in human resources? I, I, I see a recurring pattern. Human resources because <laughs> of you. <laughs> <laughs> no, in the end, I think it's about um, that person who told you that, that you shouldn't do it because there's no money in it. I think he's yeah. wrong. Because, I, I mean, I'm the, I'm the prime example of uh, someone who has studied or who tried studying something because he didn't really know what to do and uh, not, not not I didn't know not what to do but um, I wasn't too sure about what to do and therefore I studied law for example 
of course, this is something with a broad range of, of, of knowledge and you can basically do anything. But in the end, I ended up studying uh, politics, history and philosophy because right. I love politics, history and philosophy. And in the end, I ended up uh, working in human resources, which has in the end nothing to do with that. And uh, therefore, I would tell if a kid asks me or a teenager, um, should I study that? I really love it. I would tell that, uh, that, that person, yes. Yeah, go for it. Do it. If you end up working in archaeology uh, later on, who knows? But with that degree, you can even end up working for a consultancy, uh, even though yeah. I wouldn't recommend that to him. Yeah, that's true. But then we also have to recognize that, the, um, let's say, money wasn't really a, uh, an issue for us. So it's very different if you are trying to tell this story to a, to a poor Colombian or Brazilian guy who they really are struggling to, uh, to get food every day, then if you get the opportunity to, to go to university, maybe you are the first one that got uh, um, to university in, in your whole uh, family history, then I can imagine that should be really, that could be really a, a, an issue or, or a topic. Not too sure. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, I disagree. I mean, um... again, I mean, yeah, again, he's, <laughs> he's on a roll today. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise that, podcast, that podcast gets too boring for the listeners. Um, we, yeah, the we problem is I'm Colombian, you're a white man. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the end, I mean, even with a degree where the chances of getting a job uh, working uh, in that uh, area of expertise is relatively low, then you basically need to broaden your horizon and say, okay, I studied uh, music or mathematics. Um, yeah. I, won't, I won't have a chance to get to, to become a, a math professor or a math teacher at school, but um, maybe, uh, I don't know, an engineering company is looking for mathematicians, math, uh, mathematicians and therefore I'll start working there. I mean, it, it doesn't make sense to me to study something just because you think you have a higher chance of getting a job later on. Because I'm you totally will never be, if I may fin finish that sentence, sorry, because um, you will never be uh, good at this job because you don't mm. develop a passion for that for that field. Whereas when you study something you're really in love with and you can create a passion for it, then you will for sure find something, a, a position later on where you can also make some money. I'm I'm totally with you. So I was um, just trying to to um, make a point that that's not that easy for other people with a different background. I'm totally with you, and I would uh, desire that uh, everyone in in the world can do exactly what they love and and what they like to do. But unfortunately, the reality is uh, a bit different, and that was the the only point I I, I wanted to do it before. I perfectly agree with you, Vladi. <laughs> Yeah, and if I nice. could just add as well that yeah, I'm I'm one of like three brothers, and we are sons of uh, immigrants um, in London. We grew up there, um, so you know, we definitely didn't grow up in affluent circumstances. It was a struggle, you know, quite a lot of the time. Um, but we sort of were pushed. We pushed ourselves, um, and yeah, I mean, particularly my brothers, both my older and younger brother, are doing really, really well. Um, I'm kind of riding the wave of spontaneity. Right. Uh, in many ways, um, yeah, but they're quite fixed in their careers. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I would I would also say that it's not necessarily dependent upon how um, yeah, affluent uh, people were. Um, I think a lot of this also comes down to um, opportunity, um, a lot, you know, because at the time education was free uh, in the United Kingdom. And and also, you know, I, I was the last year where uh, we didn't have to pay for tuition. You know, and, and then yeah. after, after that, that changed. And I think this really changes the focus, you know. So, I mean, in the US, for example, it's extremely expensive, you know, for people to get a degree. Uh, and now in the UK, it's become, you know, it's nowhere near as expensive as it is in, in the US, but it, it has become a cost now. And so and not a lot of families, um, you know, can bear that cost. Um, so, you know, th there are, you know, different experiences that can be had. Um, I am aware that, for example, in, in France, um, you know, there are you know, very few opportunities for further education for specific kinds of communities, you know, within the, the social environment within France. And, you know, this obviously leads to social tension. Um, and I probably wouldn't expect anything else. Yeah, I, probably I was uh, too focused on Germany, where basically 
in theory, everybody who wants to study can study, and uh, there are yeah, it's it's still free up to date uh, despite a, a small a small fee each semester. But um, yeah, you're perfectly right. I mean, it's a totally different story in the U.S. where it's it's insanely expensive to to go to university. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and okay, so going back a little bit to to some of the things that you said earlier, um, we'll, we'll, we will uh, completely ignore the question that I asked with regards to the supervisory boards because it's clear neither of you want to address that question. So we'll ignore that. That's, that's, that's fair enough. Yeah. Let it not be said that I'm a dictator on this show. Okay. However, you know, you talked about it's important to bring in people who fit. Okay, who are the best fit for a position, who are the best candidates, regardless of any wish for diversity that there may be. However, do you think there is a there is perhaps a need for government to take a more active role here and be supportive of companies that include a certain degree of diversity? So therefore, you know, a company would perhaps not be allowed to to fail, would not be allowed to go under if they can show that they have taken due diligence steps with regards to attempting to employ from a more diverse pool of individuals? Or do you think that's going a little bit too far um, into playing politics with business? Not really. Well, I think we already have some um, kind of um, politics in that direction. Um, For example, if you hire someone who is uh, disabled or who can, yeah, who has a certain, let's say, a percentage of disability, then you get some, um, I don't know, how do you call it, Fritz? Like uh, you have to pay less taxes or I don't know, some kind of uh, advantages that uh, you get as a company as an incentivation from the government that uh, you hire um, yeah diverse people yeah but, i mean but the, the these circumstances i i'm aware of you're absolutely right um the the figures are quite small okay because um the kind of uh, individuals who you know perhaps do suffer from certain disabilities um and the kinds of roles that they would be in a position to be able you know to manage um you know, it doesn't suggest far too great uh, an expense upon the government, even though there are a lot of cases and scandals within the UK that I was reading about quite a few years ago, I must accept. Yeah, so, you know, I'm hopeful that the situation has improved. Um, But people with a long history of disability, yeah, had to go through a lot of problems when the rules changed to re-qualify themselves um, for a certain kind of certification. I don't know how the situation is in Germany. Um, But again, you know, if this indeed is as I assume, and I'm not supporting this with any kind of evidence, that this kind of government support is not too uh, expansive. You know, um, what about with regards to other kinds of diversity? For example, Germany, you know, in 2015 declared itself, not in 2015, but before then, but, you know, is a welcoming uh, country. Um, And we know that the the figures that have come out with regards to um, uh, immigration, refugees and so on, is that over a certain term, um, you know, they more than pay back the the training investment, the acceptance investment uh, that Germany has made. You know, know, is there not further means that a government can perhaps support these kinds of companies for essentially taking a slightly more courageous stance with executing diversity, introducing diversity. Hmm. Well, yeah. I'm loading I, these questions up. I know, I know. I'm sorry. No, no the thing is that I'm, I'm not sure if I'm getting the point because um, I don't know if you're talking of a possible uh, quote, the way we, we call it here in Germany, you know, like a, that you can establish something like a Frauen quote like a yeah like a minimum of a uh, women that they uh, um, have to be working for the company in a in a management position and then you can maybe maybe um, extend the concept also for refugees or for people uh, with disabilities or something like this. Are you talking about something like this? I'm talking about something similar because the word quota in itself and I've spoken to many people you know different genders and you know. 
as many as they say they're happy to have quotas, and I, for example, I'm happy to have quotas because I think uh, diversity should be forced upon certain sized companies. Um, but you know, as many as people who are supportive of quotas, a lot of the people are against quotas in the same way that you guys are, you know, with regards to you know, recruiting to a certain distinction. Um, but there should be another measure, shouldn't there, where you, you are not perhaps told you have to achieve 40% of you know, um, you know, diverse genders on the board. Um, but perhaps you know, a company can, at the end of the year, when it presents its uh, accounting figures, also provides a diversity register or perhaps diversity efforts. You know, and this would allow these companies to perhaps um you know not have to pay their complete tax bill for example support for efforts to improve diversity targets within an organization i mean is that do you think that's something that's manageable because then you're not forcing a company to do something but you're saying there are definite benefits if they do something yeah but i don't know i think you are monetizing the the the, the topic maybe because i don't know what if if you would uh, give me now like a, uh, okay, Vladi, you are now leading the people and culture team of that company. Here you have uh, 2 million euros so you can uh, invest in diversity. I wouldn't be that sure if I can use really that money and then uh, be more diverse. For sure, there's, there's a lot of things that you can do, but they, but they, um, I don't think that the, the, the problem or the solution could be paying less taxes or something uh, money related. But what about, for example, um, opening up channels of other kinds of support, for example, consultation, for example, networks, for example, um, increased telecommunication or some other kind of service, um, which isn't necessarily directly monetized, but can, of course, lead to opportunities. But are we talking about companies or about the government? I'm talking about companies being assisted by government, because before Fritz mentioned that if you concentrate, perhaps... He, um, I don't think he wants to say that's definitely the case. But if you don't focus on getting the best candidates, you know, then in such a competitive market, it's possible that a company, especially a startup, will not succeed. And so what I'm suggesting is that companies which show that they have been brave, especially in the, like, say, the, the first four or five years of a company's life, um, that government can be supportive of their diversity drive on this basis alone. Yeah, I think uh, it's definitely a good approach. It's kind of an indirect, uh, you know, they, they somehow subsidize or, yeah, that, that, that company who's brave. But in the end, it's unfortunately about a business model which has, yeah, I don't know, product market fit which works or it doesn't work. And the chances of, of, of being successful with a company is with the best fitting candidate in that sense. And I haven't thought about this. This is why I don't have uh, a good answer to your question, Zach. Sorry for that. But um, I'm, I'm, I like that idea, but I would I would have to think about it in order because there are, I think, so many factors which you have to keep in mind. And as I said, uh, in the end, all the founders, all the CEOs of those companies, they want to be successful. And uh, it's it's our jobs. Uh, it's our job. Yeah, Vladis and my job to to push diversity and to push for uh, um, yeah um, uh, a nice uh, good culture and work environment. But in with our capabilities, we are sometimes also limited. Yeah. And therefore, it might be a, a great idea if government would honor um, and, and and subsidize uh, brave approaches. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and to be very, very honest, so um, I'm not a diversity expert. I know that in, in huge corporations, um, I don't know, like a Siemens or a BASF, they even have a diversity manager. They they also have like a a, a department within the, the human resources department that they, is uh, which is working only um, on that purpose. So um, now I'm just given you more my my opinion it's it's more opinion than knowledge so i can imagine if you talk to a to a um, diversity expert or someone who is uh, working as a diversity manager then they are going to give you a, a yeah 
better answers and, and maybe they're going to say, yeah, that's a lot to do and actually we need more money. So uh, just to clarify that they, <laughs> I'm not a diversity expert. Okay, yeah. all right, that's fair, uh, that's fair enough. Yeah, sorry. Vladi, Vladi, I perfectly agree with you. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I'm also not a diversity expert, uh, not at all. So <laughs> yeah, so as, as you can imagine, we're doing, um, we are working in startups and the, the, the thing that we are doing is normally uh, done by, I don't know, 20, 25 different uh, positions in, in, a, in a large corporation. So that's why, okay, we have our focus and so on, but uh, yeah, we are far away from being now uh, like a big expert on, on such a thing like a diversity, but uh, yeah. Okay. Um, and, and also, I mean, we we came into this discussion because we wanted to talk about, you know, in some ways, structure and strategy and so on. Um, and you know, we, I think we may have touched the surface in some ways, um, but we haven't jumped in. So obviously, the benefit of that means that, you know, I'm definitely going to invite you guys back because I, I, I want to talk to you about, you know, these kinds of things, um, you know, as much as is possible. And then maybe after that, we can move on to different kinds of topics, depending on what happens. Uh, within the world um, but but a, a question that you um, uh, uh, Vladi wanted us to to look at um, you know and perhaps you don't necessarily have to go into too much detail maybe we can use this as an as an introduction for uh, for the next opportunity but you know the, the direct question is how do you turn business strategy into a people strategy um, Vlad, could, would you like sort of lead into that topic and then maybe Fritz can you know, sort of come up with some of his thoughts as well. Just, you know, if you were to introduce a way of uh, moving in this direction for a startup. <clears throat> yeah, well, that's a huge question, as you mentioned. And I would like to start with the with one thing. And as a matter of fact, is execution always a people problem and not a strategy problem? So when we are talking about executing a strategy, then the strategies then play in, let's say, a second role, because then you have to, to, to take a look if people are really understanding what they have to do, if people are really um, motivated about the, the thing that they are doing. And I can mention maybe one one example of, um, you know, change management is a very difficult uh, topic and I, I'm, I don't have to the exactly number right now, but it's something like 80, 85% of all change management projects doesn't really work in any kind of a corporation. And when when you take a look in, in, in some cases, they always start with one thing. They start asking all the, the employees of a company what is the vision of the company and what are our biggest goals this month or this uh, quarter? And in the normal case or in the vast majority of case, you get, if you have 200 employees, you get 200 different answers. So people don't really know what they are, why they are supposed to work that hard. And they are working just say, I don't know, from a nine to five, uh, doing a lot of effort, but they don't know why. So back to the questions, then our challenge or our task there is to align all those people that they really know what they are working. So being more transparent and they really understand the, the vision, the mission, and they really see a kind of a motivation because they can also see the, the impact what they are doing. So, um, yeah, maybe to, to... Uh, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I may quickly jump in. Yeah, um, sure, please. Buddy, um, the point, the impact, I think this is a very good point you made. You need to show each single employee that his or her um, work has a direct impact on uh, the, the big strategy or on, on the product or, um, of the business. And this is where most of the companies, uh, or I, I assume many companies fail in that aspect. And you can have as much transparency as you want. I mean, I mm -hmm. think this is like the first step, but showing your employee its impact. This is uh, something where you should really focus on and then you can also be, uh, you're one step um, closer to being successful. Yeah, sure. And now we are talking about um, how to execute the strategy that you define, but actually everything starts um, earlier because the, 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 the approach that they, we would like to, to have now, what we are um, aiming at, is to involve also the employees in the strategy definition. Because then when, when you receive the feedback from, from the employees, they can 
see things that you are not going to see just uh, sitting on the supervisory board or the or uh, on the management board and then you can avoid some mistakes that if you don't do it if you don't integrate all your employees while defining a strategy then you are going to have some mistakes that are, uh, are totally avoidable so it's also about uh, uh, integrating the, the 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 whole team within the uh, strategy definition and then for sure our um one of a uh, other of our main tasks is about um, learning and development learning and development shouldn't be seen as a as a benefit it's not a thing that they okay that's cool that you work for my company that's why i'm investing some money in in your development it's a thing that they we have to do and it has to be attached to the to the um to the mission to the vision to the strategy and to the to the goals of the company so it's our mm -hmm. work as as business partners that we understand okay um, if I'm working now on the fritz and and uh, I'm just um, I have only experience recruiting people for uh, I don't know uh, for sales or something like this, and and we already know that next year we are going to uh, to expand to uh, to um, yeah to improve our tech team. Then for sure that's a thing that I don't know and we can't wait till the next year so I can start learning how to do a, a tech recruitment. So it's a thing that then you have to see, okay, a, a, should I implement some upskilling, reskilling, um, let's say programs so that uh, that they, when the, the, the challenge uh, comes, then we are prepared. But isn't the strategy and the vision, isn't that the job of the, of the leadership members or the leadership team? A, it's a um, yeah but they they are not going to to execute it so that's a, the, the the important thing how to the, the way on, on how to execute it then then is where they then need our um yeah our um, partnership as hr professionals so they can also uh, create it in a way that's going to be a uh, uh, possible to uh, to be successful mm, okay I, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I find it funny, though, in, in one sense, because I do remember being told and yeah, I could be wrong here. And, uh, you know, a very large sort of online retail company. I won't mention the name, um, but I was told that this particular very large online retail company um, didn't want to have sales managers or account managers any longer than two years. That they wanted people to come in, work th for them for two years uh, and then basically go. Uh, because they'd had enough and then to bring in somebody new uh, and that was basically their model so they didn't really care about development you know they they basically recruited developed yeah. people i mean um learning and development is not a benefit for employees in the end it's a benefit for the company because yeah. the company uh, yeah uh, in, in invests in learning and development for its employees it's beneficial for that company so then it's not strange for you that, um, you know, if a company, if, if a person comes in after two years, they go and then you just bring in somebody else, as in that concept is not completely foreign to you? Um, in sales, it's not that foreign to me because sales, I mean, salespeople typically change jobs more frequently than other positions, such an accountant, for example. I'm not talking about an account manager, but accountants in terms of bookkeeping. And um, it's, it's, it's different for each position. But I think the... I don't know the reason why this big uh, online retail seller has uh, has followed up that that strategy, but um, I uh, I'm, I'm not really surprised by uh, by that in terms of sales employees. Mm. Okay, all right. Um, and also, just you know, coming back to what Vlad said earlier on with regards to you ask uh, you know if you ask 200 people their opinion on what the company's uh, sort of either culture is or approaches or business model is. Um, and, and they take give you 200 different answers. Um, you know, I've had similar experiences with regards to, you know, being agile, you know, within an organization. You know, um, now I'm not going to ask you guys to define, you know, what agile means now, because I think that would take perhaps in some ways it's only a sentence. In other ways, it takes a bit more exp explaining. Um, but you know, where do you think this lack of cohesion comes from uh, with regards to what a company's general direction is? Uh, and is that down to um, training? Is that down to management? Or do you think 
it, it's actually a, a kind of suspicious uh, approach to companies take in that they don't want their employees to know everything that they're doing because then they can go and just set up for themselves. Yeah, it's for sure a decision. What kind of culture do you would like to have uh, within your company? And I can imagine still nowadays, 2021, a vast majority of uh, companies work exactly the way you mentioned now. Like they don't, they don't care about the the employees or if they really know what are the the, the numbers or the goals and so on. And yeah, that's a, that's business. They they are just interested in 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 achieving some numbers. And, and if that's the case, uh, then the, the the work is done. But uh, let's say we are um, very privileged that we are part of this modern era of human resources, of uh, people and culture. And and yeah, and here is different. Then uh, here we really want to see that the uh, people understand the, the, the impact that they are um, creating. It's not also not, not only because it's a cool thing. It's uh, also because uh, there are many studies that uh, shows that they, that's the biggest motivation that you can have as an employee. And it's actually, you know, we all three love a uh, philosophy. So it's uh, also that the, it's a huge point when, when you see that that what you are doing has a, a sense that, that you see, okay, I'm doing it. And then at the end of the, the day or of the week or of the month, you can say, okay, that's what I created. So we have this uh, human uh, desire or necessity to to see that they, all the things that we are doing um, have a purpose and we can see the, the impact. And then talking back about companies, then there's also a thing that we can give the opportunity to the people that they not only uh, develop uh, it as employees, but also as a person. And that's a thing that you can offer when, when you um, show them that there is a reason why they are working there. There is a reason why we hire them. And there is a reason why we are expecting a lot of things so that we can succeed together as a company. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. It's in the end, also, it's, it's a combination of all sorts of, um, of, of factors, such as the management, such as the personality of each individual, such as uh, the strategy. But in the end, I think... Um, yeah, as 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 Vladi said, um, if if you can basically highlight or point out a single employee in each fireside chat or feedback session, maybe on a biweekly or monthly basis, it it's really um, it's enabling those people. It's motivating them. At least this is how it would how how that would feel for me if someone basically uh, tells me, okay, your direct impact to our last month's goals was this and that, then I would see, cool, yeah, I really, I really supported uh, or contributed uh, to, to achieving our goals last month, and um, that motivates me. I mean, I think that's, that's a cool strategy you can have. Yeah, and um, maybe an additional thing, um, <clears throat> that's also related the way, for example, you measure performance, because with that approach, it's a very different thing. It's not only about the uh, numbers, it's, but also uh, that's what we call a 360 degrees uh, performance, that the um, performance shouldn't be a manager opinion. And that's a thing that they, you only can achieve when people really know how to, to measure the, the, the um, let's say, the success of the company. In, and it doesn't matter if they are the the, 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 the office manager, the HR manager, the, fine, the head of finance or the CEO. So if I want to, um, for example, as I was um, working with uh, with Fris, he was my manager. And then as we were doing um, performance, uh, performance reviews, I was also um, evaluating Fritz performance, even that, that, that he was my manager. So the only way that I can really um, make a performance review about my manager if if I really understand what it what it's a, what the company is expecting from him, what a, what is a, the, the 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 goal of the company, what the strategy of the company, and so on, because otherwise it would be something without context. Mm, okay, um, yeah. Before you 
uh, respond angrily, Fritz, for the for the fact that uh, Vlad was uh, also analysing your performance. Um, just to point out that we, we've, um, yeah, we, we, it's the crazy thing is, you know, I feel as though we've been talking here for about five minutes, whereas the truth of the, the matter is that we've already gone through the one hour barrier. Um, so, I mean, that is, it sort of tells you exactly how much I've enjoyed your company, gents. Um, but I, you know, we're, we're pushing against uh, the, the realms of possibility when it comes to extending this conversation beyond this. Um, so what I will quickly ask you for is, um, yeah, just a couple of thoughts, uh, perhaps on you know what we've discussed and perhaps where we can take the the topic uh, next time. Um, and I, I will make a note of this. Um, and yeah, um, but basically we will call it a day for this particular session. Um. <laughs> I'm not going to edit that silence. I'm going to leave that silence in there, yeah, because yeah, I I want I want people to know, yeah, that this isn't yeah. scripted, yeah. This this shit's real, man. Yeah, <laughs> and it's not an awkward silence. I enjoy the silence. Oh, I love your I love the sound of your breathing, Fritz. I have to admit. <laughs> That should be edited. <laughs> <laughs> Why? You don't want to breathe? What do you mean? Um, well, we yeah, <laughs> another time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. All right. So you not only are you not going to answer the question about the supervisory boards, you're also not going to give me any thoughts for the next time. I understand that. No, but, but no, no, no. But oh. no, 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 no. <laughs> we will give you some thoughts, but give us some time. I mean, uh, ah, there sorry. were so many topics we we were covering this session and. I really need to reflect on that and then I can make up my mind and I will text you or call you and uh, okay. then we will have some more topics for our next session. Of course, we can define some topics right now for our listeners, but uh, that might change uh, in Absolutely. the next couple of days or weeks. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. All right. In that case, then what we can simply do is I can tell you guys how much I absolutely loved this chat and appreciate the time that you've you know, given me uh, on a Sunday afternoon um, and, you know, hopefully uh, welcome you back again at some point in the future. So my, on my part, my, my, you know, hearty thanks, gents. Yeah, I can also, re um, yeah, um, um, I, I can also respond to that with, yeah, uh, being very grateful that I could have been here and um, hopefully next time we don't talk too much about startups, also about startups, but as this podcast is called Startups and Whiskey, I'm really missing the whiskey part. So yes. maybe um, either we should, we should enjoy a few drinks next time or we should talk about that topic. Otherwise, we need to change the header. <laughs> Uh, in, that, in that case, we'll start with whiskey next time because I do like startups or whiskey as a name. But uh, yeah, OK, very good point, Fritz. Thank you very much. Uh, Vlad, I have a feeling you might agree with that because you, 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 you like the odd glass of whiskey, don't you? Yeah, you know, I'm really a whiskey enthusiast. So um, mm. that would be awesome if we could do this uh, next time. And I hope very soon. And yeah, thank you very much for the invitation today. You know, it's always a pleasure to um, to talk to you, to um, yeah, to have this kind of uh, discussions with a uh, with both of you. I'm yeah, very happy and thankful. Wonderful. All right, gents, thanks again. And uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your weekends. Too. Thank Ciao. you. And Ciao. Ciao. and a mic.